Well, let me begin by saying how grateful I am, honored I am, to be participating in this conversation tonight about some very difficult issues. And what a pleasure it is to be exchanging ideas about these difficult issues with three such distinguished friends and colleagues. Professor George and I served together for four years on the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. And I think he will agree with me when I say that I wish that that commission had spent more time on Europe. I think that relative neglect might have been due in part to the fact that we were concentrating on horrific atrocities in many other parts of the world. But sometimes an early warning is just as important as a condemnation of behavior that has spiraled into chaos. So tonight we're here to discuss not one, but two alarming trends in Europe. The increasing threats to religious freedom and the increasing incidence of anti-Semitic activities. A whole conference could have been devoted to either one of those subjects. But since they are combined this evening, I assume that the organizers of the conference expected us to say something, to ponder something about the connections between them. One obvious connection is that in Europe, the fear of religiously motivated violence has made Europeans more disposed to accept restrictions on religious freedom, thus opening up a whole new discussion about what restrictions are necessary and legitimate in a free society. But what I would like to explore with you this evening is a less obvious connection, one that concerns changes in Europe itself that may be contributing both to a rise in anti-Semitism and to an increasing disregard for religious freedom. So let me begin with some reflections about the sources of these two trends. According to USERF's most recent annual report, there are three primary sources for the rise in anti-Semitism in Europe, and these are the three that are most frequently named. Most obviously, the fear of Islamic terrorism, but also a rise uh, mostly on the left of a kind of anti-Israel sentiment that verges over and spills into anti-Semitism. And third, mostly on the right, some new forms of populism that have forgotten the horrors of the mid 20th century. Now, the organizers of this panel, which was originally planned way back last February, they didn't send us very many suggestions about uh, what to discuss, but one thing they did say was that there might be a fourth factor at work in, in addition to the three I just mentioned, and that they referred to very delicately as the open-mindedness of secularized Europe, which may or may not be a euphemism for the kind of open mind that so open the brains fall out. <laughs> I'm going to say some more about that factor presently, but first, if we then turn to what might be the causes of increased threats to religious freedom in Europe, we find, not surprisingly again, that the threat of religiously motivated violence is the most frequently invoked as a justification for new laws restricting religious freedom there. But if we were to look more deeply, I think we have to add two other factors. One is the well-documented growth in Europe of religious indifference, which leads many people to regard religious freedom as not very important. In fact, I would say the biggest problem we had on our commission was convincing people that religious freedom was a right worth protecting. And um, the second factor that I think we need to take into consideration is the rise in Europe of a new form of European secularism that is actively hostile to religion and that actively promotes the idea that religion itself is a major course of strife. So here's the question that I would like to pose about the relationship between the rise in threats to religious freedom and the rise in anti-Semitism. 
is Europe's increasing abandonment of its religious roots in Judaism and Christianity? Is that not only facilitating the erosion of religious freedom in Western Europe, but is it also fostering conditions that are conducive to anti-Semitism? Now, let me say a few words about that new form of, re, of uh, secularism in Europe, because I'm sure, as we all know, uh, European secularism has a long history that is marked by a certain hostility toward religion. But what is gathering force in Europe is in an atmosphere where people are already increasingly fearful of religious violence, that seems to be uh, producing fertile soil for a kind of anti-religious secularism that is much more aggressive than in the past. Um, indeed, uh, historically, European secularism was, fr especially French laïcité, that was one of the features that distinguished European secularism from the approach to the relationship between church and state in our American constitution. But that old kind of European secularism that was animated by enlightenment thought and uh, with good reason worried about the influence of religion on the state, that seems to have given way to a kind of secularism that derives much of its support from people who are fiercely opposed to traditional religious teachings on matters related to a variety of social issues, including human sexuality. And for this sort of secularist, fear of militant Islam provides the occasion to advance agendas that go far beyond separation of church and state. Thus, for example, the new secularism demands the banishment of religiously informed moral viewpoints from public discourse and the reduction of religious freedom to mere freedom of worship, we're not immune from that in the United States, or merely to a private individual exercise. As one of my law school colleagues said to me one day, well, you go to mass on Sunday and I play golf. It's a hobby. Um, now, now that an increasing proportion of the European population describes itself as non-religious, there's not much pushback against creeping inroads on freedom of conscience, the conscience rights of medical personnel who decline to perform euthanasia or abortions, or against legal prohibitions of kosher or halal slaughter, or conspicuous display of religious symbols by government workers or public school uh, students and teachers, or even uh, against proposals now being made in some countries, in San Francisco, for banning male circumcision. So I think it's pretty clear that the new secularism poses a threat to religious freedom. But what about anti-Semitism? What might secularism and religious indifference have to do with the rise of attacks on and harassment about, of Jews in Europe? In fact, one might ask the question, what's so harmful about Europe's abandonment of her religious heritage since that heritage did not prevent the horrors of the mid-20th century? And many of our colleagues, my colleagues certainly in the academic world, would argue that the sooner you get rid of religion, the more open and tolerant society will be. That's a serious contention that is being made. The contention has been challenged, however, by some of Europe's leading contemporary thinkers. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs has already been mentioned. Uh, he is certainly in the forefront of challenging those ideas. The French philosopher Pierre Manon, similarly in his new book, Beyond Radical Secularism. But the one who's most interesting to me is the self-described leftist and atheist philosopher Jürgen Habermas. What all of those three have in common, and many more, is that they've expressed the fear that of Europe's abandonment of her Jewish and Christian heritage is bringing into being a new kind of Europe where Jews and other minorities will be increasingly at risk. Habermas, I think, has stated the case as well, if not better than anyone. 
At the time of the controversy over whether the European Constitution should include a reference to its religious heritage, Habermas astonished his leftist friends by warning that the new secularism is a threat to the great political acquisitions of Western thought that progressives cherish. Respect for the dignity of the human person, human rights, the rule of law. And then, to the astonishment of his fellow atheists, he went on to claim that all of those ideals had their source, and here I'm quoting, in the legacy of the Judaic ethics ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. To this day, he said, quoting again, Europe has no alternative to this legacy. We continue to draw on the substance of this heritage. Everything else is just idle postmodern chatter, end quote. Now I trust no one here would understand the concerns of Rabbi Sachs or Habermas or Manon as nostalgia for a past that will never return, and that in any case, a past that had its problematic features, as we all know. It hardly needs to be said that any country's heritage is a mixed bag. It contains some things that are best left behind and other things that are worth preserving and building upon. What some of Europe's best minds are calling for is not a return to the past, but the continued participation in, the reinvigoration of religiously informed moral viewpoints in dialogue with the Enlightenment inheritance, in dialogue with Greek philosophy, in dialogue with Roman law, everything that made up so much of European culture. They are calling for those voices in the discussion of what Europe is and what Europe will become. They do not want to lose the synergy between faith and reason, belief and unbelief, Jerusalem and Athens. The synergy that has been the wellspring of so many of Europe's greatest political and cultural achievements. They're worried that Europe is losing her moral compass. They're worried that Europeans are increasingly unable to say what principles they will defend and why they will defend them. Pointing to Europe's low birth rates in combination with the decline of biblical religion, an Italian writer, Giulio Meotti, recently put it this way, an agnostic and sterile continent is a continent that will have no strength either to defend itself against existential threats or to assimilate a civilization of the zealous and the young. I think it would be a mistake to ignore those concerns about the political consequences of a situation where Europeans are increasingly unable to articulate what they stand for. I think it's necessary to take seriously that we may be viewing a moral vacuum in which anti-Semitism and other evil ideas will find little check and where the weakest and most vulnerable members of the society will always be the most at risk. That's why even self-described non-believers, Habermas in Germany, Marcello Pera in Italy, I could name many others, they have begun to ask how Europe will confront the challenges of the future if she re rejects her religious heritage. How will she sustain those high-minded principles and commitments that are historically derived from that heritage? You might say multiculturalism. You might say human rights. But those are just empty words if there is nothing intrinsic about human beings that is worth defending, that requires that human beings not be killed, violated. So to conclude, I'm aware that there are very powerful and strong arguments against the views that I have just put forward. There's a deep division of opinion here and in Europe on whether Europe that banishes its religious heritage can sustain a free and decent society. It's a division of views that concerns one of the most important questions in political theory. Does secular liberalism contain within itself what it needs to sustain liberal values and virtues? And reasonable people differ 
in their answers to that question. Nobody knows whether such an experiment would really work out. But if we get it wrong, the stakes are very high. For there is one fact about which reasonable people cannot disagree, and that is the political and social health of the free societies is being closely watched every hour of every day by persons who have no respect for our hard-won freedoms and less regard for the religions that have sustained them. Thank you.